Hello, good evening everyone and a warm welcome to BIC Streams. On the occasion of World Mental Health Day, today's session is Hold On to What? We have with us today experts in wellness and mental health, Kate Donahue, Sukhvinder Sarkar, Ratna Isaac and Leonila Guerra, moderated by Brinda Jacob Javra. Thank you, Leka. Um, and uh, just welcome to everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm really excited to have this opportunity to talk to all of y'all. I feel uh, lucky to have experienced y'all uh, quite closely, both uh, as, as teacher, teachers and as well with work. So I'm super excited to have this, uh, to be able to moderate this uh, discussion. And thank you, Kate. I know that it's very early in the morning for you. Thank you for making the time. Yeah, um, so I'm just gonna jump right in. Uh, one of the reasons why we decided to do this with BIC is because we've really uh, been finding that uh, uh, as mental health professionals, the number of clients we're seeing, the cases we're seeing have really increased since the pandemic began. So we also have been hearing a lot about um, how I mean, uh, there have been a lot of articles about how they're expecting this to become worse. Yeah, both uh, the uncertainty of the situation, uh, the kind of very intense lockdowns that we've experienced here in India, and I think to a large extent in the US, the economic recession, um, uh, I think globally, but especially in our countries, the social unrest. Yeah, so kind of keeping all that in mind, and, and the fact that in India, uh, mental health is still in many ways taboo. Uh, people are not reaching out for the support they need to reach out, uh, you know, and, and, and there's quite, um, uh, so keeping that in mind, I'm just wondered if each of you could speak a little bit about what is the trend you notice? What are, you know, what do you all foresee? Um, you know, possible dangers, uh, ways that we can hold it, um, you know, and um, maybe Ratna, you know, if you would start, because I know that you've also been associated for a long time with Minhans, and it's really one of the premier institutes of mental health. So, uh, you know, to just give us um, an overview. Okay, so I, I studied in Minhans, so that was like quite a, about 15 years ago. But I can definitely sort of talk about how how I've seen the mental health uh, scene change and evolve from 15, 20 years back to now. Um, you're saying that, you know, it's still a taboo topic in India, but what I'm finding is that more and more people are willing to seek mental health. They're not waiting to be referred by a doctor or a psychiatrist. More and more clients are just coming and saying, okay, I'm not really able to deal with this or cope with this. Um, I think most therapists have most of their slots full. Uh, and, you know, it is, as you said, so much more during this uh, COVID time. Um, so, yeah, I think the first thing I was thinking was that people are reaching out. Okay. Of course, there are many, many more who could, and hopefully through forums like this, more people will sort of get familiar with the idea and do that. Um, in terms of what I'm seeing, like the kinds of, let's say, more specifically COVID-related issues that are coming up. Uh, currently, you can definitely see the impact on families, um, you know, and very often each family member has a slightly different approach to how seriously they want to take COVID, how safe do you want to be, how much anxiety you're experiencing around getting ill itself, and then there are definitely conflicts which arise around that. Um, with the lockdowns and with all everyone being at home together all the time, which is, I think, really not something that we're used to, I see actually both positives and negatives from that. 
On the positive side, many more clients are saying, oh, we have time to spend with our families. I have teenagers saying like, oh, my, my mom is there to sort of help me in the morning and even do small things like make my bed and that feels good. And I have parents saying this last six months that I've spent with my son. We know each other so much better. So I think, you know, it's not all been necessarily bad. But of course, the lack of privacy, the lack of sort of just access to your normal ways of coping or venting or spending time with and away from each other is also definitely creating, I think, a lot of strain. Um, like any crisis, I guess it sort of it exposes both underlying strengths as well as underlying cracks and that's something that we can see here. For the future, I think possibly what, what would worry me is I'm seeing that the way in which a lot of people are coping with the current situation, um, there's not much pleasure you can get, so you eat a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, you're not really able to go out, so you spend a lot more time on the internet. Uh, so I'm wondering what this is going to do to, um, to addictions, uh, what it's going to do to health overall. And I think that that's something that we might see emerging. Um, of course, I have a lot more to say about that, but. Yeah. I'd like to hear from the others as well. Thank you. I just want to say it's interesting what you said. There's, there's good and bad. And sometimes I have, I come across people who are like super thrilled in the morning because it's blissful to be with the family. By night, it's a different story. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, maybe Kate and Leonla, if you can share a little bit about also the work that you're doing. I know that Ratna specializes when, in couple and family work, right? Uh, relationships and yeah but I do see oh, a large yeah. number of individuals as well okay. so I'd say sort of across the adult spectrum um, yeah quite a few yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and one Wait. of the things sorry Kate speak no I just was wondering if Leon and I would like to go first okay. or I... you can go you can go okay thank you <laughs> okay Brenda, were you wanting to no. go? No, no. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, in the United States, uh, we, we are dealing with a lot of different things. And, you know, we have an election coming up, which is very, I, I don't know what the right word is. I'm just going to say crazy at the moment. And um, in California, we've had the fires Mm -hmm. as well as the pandemic. And what I have been finding is that uh, a lot of clients have been returning, even my clients in San Francisco, because of Zoom, have been returning. And there has been an increase in anxiety. I think that uh, the not knowing when this is going to end and the not knowing that uh, since it's airborne, people, there's been a great increase in anxiety. Also for people who um, now have to be home and more isolated, I've seen uh, an increase in some ser very serious depression. And um, there's been more suicide attempts and uh, and some of it is, uh, you know, a pre-existing condition that's exacerbated by uh, the pandemic, feeling alone, feeling like you can't touch anyone anymore. And all of these things, that these natural ways that we get the good neurotransmitters going, people don't have anymore. And there's a real longing to be to be held and touched and interact. But the, the fear is, is so great. And people 
most of the people I see, all the people I see are um, very compliant with masks and washing hands and social distancing. One of the things that I have seen with families is that uh, I've, I've had a number of clients returning and you know, this is a, a time where I saw, I'll give one example. A, a woman I saw when she was single until the birth of her children, they were one and two when we stopped seeing each other. Now they're 14 and 12 and they're both boys and they're not listening to social distancing, to, you know, not going into stores and things like that. And then it gets compounded in the summertime with the freedom of experimenting with drugs. So I've gone on this journey with a number of families of how to uh, be a united front with your partner in terms of rules about COVID and then how to handle the drug situation, which it, in the United States, it's sad to say, but around 12, kids start experimenting, especially boys. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's been very complicated with trying to keep a job, keep centered yourself, and deal with your teenage children. The other uh, aspect that I've seen a great deal, and this is with people with trauma, they have become really, really obsessive compulsive. You know, they they go out, they come in, they take a shower and change their clothes. They're overdoing it and they're feeling so locked in because they're so afraid not to do these things. And they try. We've done things like, well, just try for a half hour. And the anxiety and the fear is so intolerable. They just have to go back to the rituals they've done. Mm -hmm. So I see it affecting the population a great deal. You know, kids, um, I see some teenagers and they, you know, they can't make friends or hang out with their friends, which is so important in that those teen all the time, but particularly your peer group becomes your point of reference. So I think the isolation, the unknown, the seriousness of it compounds the developmental issues that come up in families and increases the anxiety and depression for many people and the uh, obsessive compulsive aspects of dealing with this. Um, so I have a great deal of compassion. I, I know my own anxieties, but um, people I think in the United States are more open to therapy. So I see a lot of, I hear from a lot of people who want to start therapy or continue therapy. And yeah, it's, it, it's a very confounding. And I agree about the addiction part. Uh, I just think people don't know how to cope now. We've never had this where we have a pandemic and economic collapse, climate change, and, and in California, uh, we have, in the country, we have uh, a movement for racial equality that is very strong that you may have heard of, Black Lives Matter. And also in California, we've had the fires. So people are losing their homes. So it, I always say it feels apocalyptic in that it feels so huge that people really don't know how to cope. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I can come in. Yeah. So what I am seeing is, uh, it is like suddenly there is a shift in the situation of all over the world, and people nobody was prepared for it, and uh, so there is fear. The unknown, it is as if the unknown has descended on human beings and uh, people do not know. 
and it is also has created a lot of uncertainty. So they do not know anymore how to live. So what is happening is those who are already, those who have mental health issues, that is exacerbated. There is a, because they were actually practicing, they were in social groups, they were trying to maintain their health and no, then suddenly that was not possible. And uh, so that has uh, impacted a lot. So that is one of the problems. But even for those who were, let's say, this so-called, I mean, the, let's say the others, the healthy, there is, I think there is a range of reactions from that also. Because I think uh, people moved to the edge because of this, because suddenly uh, death was in front of them and they didn't know how to react to that. So uh, that has uh, created, uh, uh, I think, uh, more anxiety in people. And uh, many people thought, even if uh, people come to check their health, they may take away their wealth. Mm -hmm. So that fear also was there here in Bangalore, because there was no proper uh, information. Uh, it is also because of that. and. Uh, then the impact on relationships at home, yeah, people were also happy that they could spend time, as you all have said, but then uh, also because face-to-face -face time was more, so aggression was is, uh, targeted more to the family members. That also happens. So it is uh, both positive and negative. Then there is another uh, uh, phenomenon that is happening because a lot of people travel to their native place. Mm -hmm. And some of them, when they traveled, the, the, some villages, they did not allow them to come in. You are coming from the city, you are bringing more illness. So then uh, there were conflicts with regard to whether they should be there or not. So there were, they had to face those issues. And uh, uh, also people have traveled to their native place and uh, uh, a lot of people have lost their jobs and uh, children are uh, more on the internet and online classes and uh, which is not uh, for the future i'm seeing that that may itself become an issue uh, so uh, mainly i think uh, it is the fear that has created and the impact on the economy and the established structures somewhere uh, they are broken in some way. Uh, there is no more uh, they can uh, depend on that to get their uh, uh, living. So uh, that is a big problem actually. So I think it is, uh, it is not just the health, it is health and then all the support that one can get for health, that is the, also the economy that has uh, there is no money, people do not know how to live. They have lost their jobs. I think uh, so, uh, I think uh, I will uh, stop here. Yeah, no, I think even just witnessing, even for families that are uh, relatively stable, uh, you know, just witnessing this kind of suffering and devastation in the collective has had like a huge impact. And I think in India, like you said, we really were witness to the uh, to a, a layer that we don't see otherwise, I think, you know, the very poor and how uh, and what, you know, and I know that they've always been here, but we've managed to go through our lives without seeing it and then having to really see it in our faces, you know, like millions like suffering and struggling to get home, to get food. Um, yeah, it's I think that that has been also quite devastating. Um, but, you know, you, you brought up a couple of things, Leonla, about the unknown and, um, uh, you know, I, I've just wondered if Sukhminder, you have something to say to that, because I know that's really what your work is about, um, you know, uh, or. Uh, thank you, Brinda. Actually, I'm a little bit of an oddball in this group because I'm not a mental health professional as such. Um, though I work with uh, groups and uh, uh, mostly women. 
So, uh, and I was enjoying what Leonila was saying. Uh, she spoke about things getting broken. According to me, they were already broken. Yes, exactly. More broken. Or in a way, uh, the brokenness is getting highlighted. Yes. In, in this process of, you know, how wrong things are in the world and the way we are living. So, uh, we needed the pandemic to be able to see that that uh, it's really time for some wisdom traditions to come back and teach us once again how to live with community. The very fabric of the communication community is torn. Yes. Uh, and uh, I think the dilemma of mental health which is happening is because we have become so separated from each other. So, um, there, is, there is no place like going home, you know, we don't know where home is, that mm -hmm. sense of belonging. And uh, so, uh, one of the things uh, we can fall back on is uh, relearning our indigenous traditions and uh, Ways, simple ways of living. So um, the the pandemic has had a lot of uh, problems, and uh, it has created uh, so much unemployment and hunger and problems. But it has also given back to us the blue skies and clean waters. I live by the Ganga, and it has become so clean. It was absolutely polluted and mucky, and today yes. the was clean. So, uh, in a way, nature is also healing. And uh, maybe we, we are also, in a way, it's too short term for us at this moment, maybe we don't feel it, but something is mending at the same time. So, for now, I leave it here. <laughs> and then yeah. we, can, we can go more. Yeah. I'd like to yes, add. yes, Kate. Yes, go right. I just wanted to add that this is so, such a universal dilemma. I supervise people in a number of different countries and everyone is going through that. I was supervising somebody in Germany and they're, even though their numbers are better, they're having an upsurge um, in Hong Kong and in mainland China. There's a, um, there's just something that's un, uh, unearthing the fabric of relationships and the fabric of how our worlds have been created that hopefully we can bring them back uh, when we know, you know, when there's a vaccine and we can all uh, partake in that. But this is such a universal in the language I would say is archetypal experience that what we know as life is changed. The, the, the total fabric of society all over has, has um, mm -hmm. really changed. It really has, yeah. Um, uh, just to say, uh, Sukhmandar, you said that you're an oddball. Uh, really not, because for me, I, I when when we were kind of creating this panel, I, I wanted to see because earlier when when I started off, there was psychiatry and there was counseling, and I feel like now with expressive art therapies, with coaching, with process groups, there's just so much, so many more gaps that are being filled. You know, uh, uh, with like, uh, and and we're looking at well-being, and we're looking at um, at least the way I see it is the body, mind, and soul being in alignment. And I think you know well, there are so many ways to do it, you know, and not just um, traditional therapy. Uh, and I think we reach out to so many more people, and which is why I really also wanted to have you here because I feel like that's an important um, aspect. And I know that Leonola does. You know, you do coaching and you do therapy, 
and uh, you know so, and you work with spirituality as well you know uh, eastern and western spiritual philosophy um kate is uh, i know your your you know your background in counseling psychology but all your work with the expressive arts as an expressive art therapist i think this is what we're constantly doing is to find sukundari talk about we we don't, we've lost our home but I, for me i feel like it's an invitation to see the body as the home you mm. know and and uh, since that has not changed you know and and as so the outside or the collective is disintegrating and we're we're really left with almost the essential or the you know uh, or something that doesn't change and and how do we kind of Uh, find a ground through that um uh, i i just i want you know when from here i want to go on to the uh, thing because i know in depth psychology again kate i know that's your background and <coughs> i i've heard this from you all the time is uh, you know we talk we're working with the personal the interpersonal and the transpersonal or the collective and in india uh, spirituality is very much part of our daily lives you know and i just wonder and i know so so far we not i don't know about the amount of transpersonal psychology that we practice here and i just wondered if there was a way that we could use spirituality to be a support you know because everything else is now uh, uh, and you know but given the fact that right now religion is such a highly charged topic you know and it causes so much polarization it causes so much um, you know and i know personally a lot of my friends would rather stay away from religion than be uh, or even spirituality to that extent than be party to the evils that's being done in that name you know so i wonder are we you know are we losing a a a, a support structure are there ways that we can integrate this in the healing space in in psychology in mainstream psychology and what are the dangers of doing this you know what what do we uh, you know and what do we need to be careful about and i think one of the questions actually uh, that come up a lot um with with the students is how neutral can a therapist be you know is it is it okay for and, and especially in times of social media is it okay for therapists to be vocal about their their points of view and how do you know so um and i think it's all new right because social media is also new uh, people are see meeting their therapists on social media for the first time like we not like you know we were you know when i was taught in my counseling course we were taught not to have any relationship with our clients we don't know them we don't share anything it's you know but all that is changing so fast and how do we negotiate it i know there are three questions in one but just whatever like interests you if you can just dive into it because i know these are questions that my uh, students were interested in as well so whoever feels like diving in and um um yes definitely i could start with a couple of things um one i feel that <clears throat> issues as as everyone was talking about the sense of what's happening to the world uh you know what can we trust we we can't trust the air we can't trust any systems to protect us nothing really seems to be working and uh, what's going to happen to me what's going to happen to the world i think that we're hearing it more and more in sessions and really the pandemic is something it's pan to therapists as well right so it's not like we are outside of what our clients are dealing with and then looking from some superior view and saying okay this is how you sort your thing out i think we're all very much swimming in the same sea and all dealing with the same worries and the same anxieties and um i find it extremely at least for clients it's really interesting just to have the space to to be able to bring this up it's these are not issues which are i'm sorry is my mic 
um, a little bit echoing. Maybe, yeah. Now, now I think when you're closer, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. So, I think that uh, you know, it's really kind of uh, important for us to be able to talk about these things in sessions, as and when clients bring them up and clients are much, much more actively bringing this kind of thing up as well. Uh, no. And yes, so it is important to sort of both be able to speak about it as well as to be open, I think, for us to what we are experiencing. Um, and we're finding different ways of connecting with clients because this is so much of a shared experience. Um, yeah. I'd like to say a couple things, if that's okay. Uh, about the expressive arts in particular, and I know Brenda is uh, hosting a course called the Expressive Body. And one of the tools that we have in expressive arts is to go back, what, as Brenda said, to our homes. So I use a lot of body, somatic, body-oriented processes. So to come back to the present moment, to listen to the body, and you might be saying one thing here, but the body is doing something different. So to get the integration of the mind, body, and spirit. And one of the ways that I bring what I call spirituality, I don't talk about religion, but if someone is religious or has a religion and they're, it's helpful to them, I support them, but I talk about it as something we feel inside and outside in terms of the spirit. So, in coming back to the present moment, coming back to the body. Also, I use a lot of symbolic imagery. Um, on, online, it's harder to do uh, sand play, but you can do many other things. I do a lot of movement processes. Uh, I've done some drama. But I also work with uh, a healing image or a safe image that tends to have all the aspects you mentioned, Brenda. It's personal, it's cultural or cross-cultural, and it's also archetypal so that you're feeling that other dimension of the transpersonal. So the use of imagery the use of the arts over, oh, you can watch somebody move or create or I bring in music. and Music is a great way to get to that spiritual dimension because it just, it's so nonverbal. And it's, as you, we know, it gets into the, the deeper neural transmitters in the brain. So it takes us to a different place. So I would encourage people to consider getting trained and to use the expressive arts because it's really taking us back to these indigenous ways of healing, not just through thought, but through the whole body and through all the different ways we experience the world. And so, and I think Brenda might want to talk about uh, the, the feminine when we get there and it's an embrace of the feminine parts of us for everyone and you'll Brenda you'll say more about what you're doing yeah um, actually thank you Kate and I don't know if Leola you have something yeah. to say because I know that the body is very important in your work as well yeah uh, in the work that you do and then maybe Sukhvinder could uh, tell us a little bit more about the work with the feminine See, okay, can I? Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Actually, uh, when we look at this uh, ancient times in India, 
uh, how people lived. It was uh, lived in a more holistic way. And there was, we cannot separate physical health and mental health, for example. They are inseparable. Mm -hmm. So whatever happens to the body impacts mind and whatever impacts mind impacts body. <coughs> there is also the intermediate bridge between the mind and the body so now the when the problem in a crisis when the problem comes it's uh, if person a person has awareness about different layers of oneself i think the person is quite strong to deal with the crisis now, and that is the spiritual energy then is available through consciousness of the person. Now, uh, I don't say in the West also, I think uh, it has reached a stage with the Carl Jung uh, uh, recognizing that uh, the how, for example, uh, uh, energy, what uh, energy, what libido, for example, what role it plays. It is no more sublimation, but it is same thing. It is a, there is not a primary and secondary energy. It is the same energy that is there as power, sexuality, or religion. So the expressions are different, for example. And also, how uh, uh, after middle age, for example, a person tends to become more spiritual. So I think the same was there in the involution of uh, the, was uh, stated in uh, India, for example, how a person studies in the first uh, years of life, then the self mastery was supposed to be there. And then uh, uh, the second half of life, you start, so there is competency built in in the first half. Second half, you more uh, start contracting, you come out, you create more of inward you and those who are able are also able to renunciate and uh, go in, inward because uh, i think uh, individuals uh, every human being is a citizen of two uh, different worlds outer and inner so the bridge creating that bridge i think uh, that is possible through art therapy music and uh, uh, how to uh, make this use of this intermediate uh, life uh, between the body and the mind which is there uh, that is the breath that carries the energy that is prana i think uh, that is where uh, 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 everything is integrated so uh, i think the spiritual uh, here uh, a person uh, it was taken for granted that uh, after uh, uh, that uh, renunciation is for uh, searching the truth and the self, inner self. So, like, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, so, I think uh, this uh, therapy, uh, when, we when we include energy, body movement, art, other arts, music, I think uh, then it, ten it uh, brings out the whole. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, I think that, that is important. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I, it's interesting. Unless you have a question. No, uh, when, you, when you speak, I'm actually thinking about somebody that I follow right now, Michael Mead. He, he, he's, he's a storyteller. And he talks about um, two kinds of education. Like the first, the first education is to maybe get a livelihood. And the second one is to kind of the inner moving inside to kind of uh, uh, peel off the layers to to have a uh, sense of the authentic self of who we really are, the essence of who we are. And I really enjoy listening to him because he really seems to be working at that intersection between arts, like storytelling, psychology, spirituality, and really in that space uh, where it's not this or that, you know. Um, um, and I, I mean, the work that I know all of you all do is really seems to be from that space. Um, I wonder, Sukundar, if you could take off from here, because I know the work you're, that you do so, uh, I mean, you know, what I really love about your work is really going into that, into the dark, into the unknown, into going in like what Leonla spoke about, you know, this uh, retreating. And I, 
And for me, somehow with this pandemic, it really seemed like that time of retreat. We were all retreating inward uh, or into Thank our heads. And um, I don't know if you want to share something from this. And I'd love to hear, Ratna, your kind of uh, take on... Uh, yeah, sorry, Leona, yes. Uh, see, there are two aspects here. For those who have gone into the process, for them mm -hmm. it was also a retreat for us, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. But what happened simultaneously, we witnessed the poorest having nothing and no food to eat and they had to move to their native places and they were in trouble, which we had not faced earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, the extreme of it, the life difficulties. So while retreating, we had to face the collective what is happening and uh, to deal with that. I mean, uh, we can't uh, pretend to deal with that because there is a part of us suffering. Yeah. So that is what uh, I think uh, yeah. we need to address that. Yeah. Yeah. There are two aspects of it. Absolutely. And I think this is what Ratna speaks about that, uh, you know, something like this really brings brings the cracks open the everything is visible now you know we can no lo we're no longer in the in the little bubbles that we spoke about and now it's all up for us to see so i'm actually when once sukundar speaks a little bit i'd love to hear ratna your your take on this as well um yeah yes. sukundar do you want to take? yes wonderful uh, discussions and questions brinda so um but that brokenness that we were talking about. Yeah. And uh, the pandemic in a way is a result of that brokenness itself because we, we have learned only to live as consumers. There is no other way we know how to exist other than just to be consumers. The, uh, the education we receive is just so that we can get a good job and survive. And um, so it didn't, didn't equip us for, for a time such as this. And now, we, what do we fall back on? What is, what, is, what is it that will support us when none of this is working? You know, there are no malls, there are no shops, there are no movie theaters, there are no vacations, there are no planes. What do you fall back on? So... Uh, this is where the work of the feminine comes in, you know. It is like, it's been starkly shown that where is she? You have to bring her in. And uh, in the work that I do, um, we are encouraging um, everybody, especially the women, you know, to, they're going back to the rituals. So ritual is, rituals is like what Kate was also talking about. Um, you know, the things that we do like dance or music or drawing. These were all already incorporated in the rituals we used to do when we used to live our, our lives, our, even two generations ago, or one generation ago. So, um, so what we are doing now, we are doing things like rangolis or ulams or, uh, you know, we are having gatherings even on Zoom where we are learning uh, simple kirtans and there will be a group of 20 women and each one will be singing because we can't sing together because of the uh, technology, but two lines and then two lines and then two lines and so the whole community is singing together. Mm -hmm. and uh, um, dance. Uh, we are having discussions about food and we are really going back to, to good health and uh, falling back into uh, taking care of our diets, exercise, yoga. And, uh, and one of the very powerful things, you were talking about religion, one of the very powerful things is, uh, you were also talking about Michael Mead, so is mythology, you know? Mm. All of us have a mythic heart. What has happened to that mythic heart? Somewhere 
we had lost it. So uh, Kate was talking about archetypes. So uh, one of the ways in which we are also working is bringing mythology back alive in people's lives. It is not something that happened thousands of years ago. It's happening now, right here. It's yeah. always, mythology is always current, whereas religion could be, I mean, it, it, it is different, but uh, mythology is a very big, like if you take India, it's a very big cradle. You know, the minute you tell a, a mythology story, everybody knows it. You know, you don't have to be educated or you don't have to, whether it's a rickshaw puller or it's a very rich businessman, we all know these stories. So, uh, so the enactment of that or the understanding of that or the relating of that can also be very healing if it's done in a proper way. So, so yeah, these are some of the things. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, just before Ratna, before you start, I just also want to maybe in your conversation when you're speaking also to say uh, one of the things that I, I feel like in this time for me was um, uh, mental health practices or self-care practices, you know, because it, I feel like we, you know, whether we do practice yoga or meditation or journaling, we do it in times of well-being so that we have a sense of how do we access what we need to access in times of crisis. Um, so um, I know when we come from the arts or we come from, you know, there are, there's a certain discipline that, they, you know, uh, each of us may choose. And I'm really curious, uh, Ratna, when you speak, is to tell, tell us a little bit about what, what, what are mental health practices that everybody can, you know, can, can count on or can dip back into to, to access that, that place of strength. Again, like, um, uh, you know, okay, like, because you say, and I, and I think, and I think that's what we've said this whole time is any situation has both holds the wounding and the potential. I know that you say this all the time and I say it all the time to my students. And I think we've said that in this, in this conversation as well, right? This has been such a kind of catastrophe, but so much of healing possibility. Uh, so I was just wondering, Ratna, if you can tell us a little bit from a clinical perspective, you know, uh, how, how do these concepts, because it feels philosophical, but I, I really believe that they have a place in mental health and psychology. So I, I'm curious to hear from you. I'm, okay, I'm not sure how exactly I'm going to be answering your question, but um, I suppose for each of us, there is a different thing that replenishes us. Mm -hmm. And it can be, uh, for one person as mundane as sort of um, going for a walk every morning. Um, or it can be spending time with yourself, allowing time for reflection or allowing time for journaling or as you said, allowing time for things like that. Um, I, don't, I don't think that I would say there are any specific practices that, oh, you should do more of this. But I think I'd say more that spending time trying to figure out what does replenish you mm -hmm. um, and becoming aware of that and being willing to put time and effort into doing it, being often with self-care, I think, we don't give ourselves permission to do it. And, you know, that's, that's sort of the first, really the first mountain to climb. So I'd actually say giving yourself permission to, to understand what it is that, that works for you and allowing yourself to do it is probably the most important thing. Yeah, so there's no self-care without a knowledge of self. Without, yes, I yeah. Or what sure. is self-care without uh, knowing what is self, yeah. Without knowing, yes, what the self is or what mm. the self needs. And I think being okay with, with whatever it is that does work for you. Mm -hmm. um, I see not everybody is necessarily able to meditate, although for sure everyone I know of who does finds that to be 
an extremely useful thing to do. Um, so it's, I guess, finding, like I said, what you need. I, I'd like to add that, you know, I think one of the main characteristics of human beings is that we are, we're, we're endlessly adaptable. Mm -hmm. And we are endlessly resilient. And what I have found through the course of this COVID is all the different ways in which people have been able to find their strengths. All the different ways in which people have been able to connect. So if I can't talk to you on the phone, like Sukhvinder was saying, then we will have a Zoom gathering and we can still have that shared experience if we need to. Um, and yeah, so I, I think that what I'm seeing is that this is sort of giving people time, I think, to, to really look inside themselves and understand what it is that they need and, and find ways of, of meeting that need, no matter what the circumstances are. Um, everyone was thrown for the first couple of months um, and I can definitely see, of course, for some people, you did, they did well initially and then they experienced a sort of erosion because, okay, something which worked for two months doesn't necessarily work Forever. for four months. But I'm now seeing after that kind of dip that people are saying, okay, I can't see this as a short-term thing to cope with. I need to see this as a long-term thing to cope with. And they're finding new ways of accessing, accessing their strengths again. So yeah, I think on the whole, I feel optimistic about what people are able to do with themselves. Thank you, Ratna. There are a couple of questions that I want to go through, even though there are so many things I would love to hear from all of y'all, but we don't have time, unfortunately. Um, this, I think, is addressed. Um, it's for Akshita. She says, thank you for that, Leonela. I think it is the established structures around us that are showing gaps and flaws due to our inability to provide access and support to those who need it the most. What do you think about creating new structures? And if Leonela wants to answer that. Yeah. Yeah, creating new structures. So uh, I think, uh, see, one thing is uh, we have spoken a lot about immunity, importance of immunity also for to have this, uh, to deal with COVID. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it uh, makes a, a big difference to people uh, if there is communication and uh, uh, how exactly they can uh, be in touch with themselves, first of all, and uh, to understand what is happening with them. I think uh, that communication, uh, I think the uh, new uh, way of uh, interacting with people, I think that we have to do that. We have to establish that. Uh, first of all, I think uh, for that, uh, uh, we have to see what kind of information has to go and then it should not be confusing. And uh, I think uh, it, uh, so that it reaches people. I think new structures have to come in like that. So uh, that is uh, one thing. Secondly, I think uh, uh, when we uh, look at the uh, earlier uh, ancient life, I think we are slightly going back towards it through our um, retreats now. I think that that can come back in uh, some way the awareness. Uh, for that, uh, I think uh, I think the people, those who are, uh, they have to get this new information, I think. Uh, how uh, they can be fearless, because I also uh, want to bring back here, I think uh, one of the famous sentence of Swami Vivekananda saying, uh, uh, to be fearless and hold your head high and be fearless. So, and he was talking to people who were very poor while, uh, when he was doing that. And people understood that. 
so uh, i think the uh, uh, new structures have to come in but it takes time because right now the preoccupation is also on vaccine mm -hmm. that is also and people fear is there so even if you bring in the new structures in a formal way that is not yet uh, you know it, it is uh, difficult when first you need to deal with the fear also so first deal with the fear and give uh, proper information uh, i think that then uh, new structures will fall in place okay but when the fear but when the fear is there uh, already when the fear is there people may not even listen so first we need to take care of the fear also yeah thank you kate uh, yes i just to say that I think the new structures are emerging. I don't know if we need to do anything in particular but to invite them. There's, for example, there's a, uh, you can get it on YouTube. There's an actor, uh, Joseph Gordon Levitt, that created this series, Create Together, where mm -hmm. he has people making art together and singing together. And he knows the technology so he can help people integrate it. But watching his show is just to see, you know, we all have that creative spark in us and necessity is, as they say, is the mother of invention and needing to find new different ways. I think they're emerging and that we just need to attend to them mm -hmm. and yeah. use the models. and. Just leave the space open and the invitation. Mm -hmm. What do we do in this situation? I remember a friend inviting me to a virtual dinner uh, back in March. And I thought, what a great idea. Mm -hmm. You know, we both have our Zooms out and we're eating and we're going, what are you eating? And, uh, and talking to each other. And just things like that, um, they're emerging. Yeah. I, I think that's, I mean, I agree. I totally agree. Uh, I'm curious if y'all are able to, I mean, if anyone from the panel, what are the new structures that you see emerging collectively? Because we can see, I mean, I think it's, we're all witnessing destruction of a lot of old structures or collapsing of the old. Uh, is any, I mean, are we able to see anything new that's emerging? Not yet, maybe? Or is there a sense of, uh, of something shifting. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of curious to know where all of y'all are, or, or what you all see. So uh, I think that uh, this is the time when a huge pause button has been pressed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, everything has been put on pause. Mm -hmm. And it is like, Things the way they were running cannot run anymore. It's mm -hmm. not sustainable. Mm -hmm. So the understanding of what is sustainable is is coming into into the collective. That hang on, what we were doing was not sustainable. And suddenly, when you know people are not working, uh, uh, not commuting to work anymore, but still work is happening. <laughs> How is that possible? Oh my God! It's such a lot of saving of energy is happening when you're still working, but you're at home. The output is still the same. So, uh, so what, what is happening right now is people are finding different ways to do the same thing. But what is emerging, which is still in the background, is do we really have to do the same thing? And I think in the next six months, something, I have a sense that something will emerge because uh, this extraction mentality that I have to extract the maximum out of every situation, it will collapse. So it's my reading. Because what, what we have lost is our ability to understand patterns. And that is why I was bringing in the, the, the mythic heart and the understanding of mythology because we are unable to understand patterns. We are un unable to understand that there is already a structure. 
which is a cosmic structure which is required which is uh, we are not aligned with it we have moved so far away from from the way things ought to be so right now it is a collapse and structures will emerge so that's the way i'm seeing it yeah i don't know if it makes sense <laughs> yes yes it makes a lot makes of sense um i just want to say i have a whole lot of questions so this is from satyashri and uh, i think it's interesting this she says many of my clients are resource poor most of them do not have the space or courage to speak about their issues in telephone counseling additionally we cannot see them does anyone in the panel have suggestions on how to help these clients um i don't know who maybe i don't know if it's ratna who could yeah do you have uh, any thoughts about that you know as therapists the one thing that we can't actually do is to go out into the real world and change some of these structures or resources or lack of resources that our clients have or don't have and i guess that to some extent that's the limitation we have to accept that i can support you in dealing with whatever it is that you have to deal with but i can't actually change what it is that you have to deal with but in doing that i think that we often um we underestimate just how valuable it can be for someone who's feeling desperate to to have someone who's willing to hear them out um to have someone who's willing to care about whatever it is that they are going through and even if all you can do is to enter into that struggle with them um that i think itself is a meaningful thing um and so you know i would say just just keep answering the phones and uh, let 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 the person at the other end of the line know that you are you are there for them um and that you are willing to hear them out um having said that of course in this at this time in particular what what resources we may have access to you know if you know that okay if there is a food shortage then this is a center you can go where they are providing food or if there is an employment issue then this is this is an ngo which is working with with employment so if you are a migrant laborer this is where you can go i think it's important for all of us to sort of keep a list of potential yeah. resources that we can uh share with our clients that that they can use um if you do want to take it one step further i would say to actually network with those people where you are referring clients to or spend some time looking up vetting for yourself what might be good places you send them so you're not just kind of saying try these three numbers and someone might be able to help you but you're able to maybe give them much more specific suggestions about what they can do um yes but i do still think that the main stay of therapy really is your ability to be there with someone in whatever it is that they are struggling with and whether that's on the phone or whether that's on zoom or whether that's on person the the essence of it as a dream change thank you thank you um the next question is from elisha she says for someone who hasn't really focused on spirituality what would be some suggestions to them to begin this journey during this time um and i think it'd be nice to hear from a couple of people because i think also to the concept of spirituality can be different and i think the way sukhinder sees it or leonola sees it and kate sees it um, or you know um I don't know if Kate is here. Uh, yeah, Kate is here. 
I, um, I, something happened and I, so when you dropped up, Kate, I, I, just want to, I just want to say, uh, there are a lot of people asking questions and, uh, Leka from BIC is saying we could extend it to 8.30, that we have time to 8, 8.30. I know that it's the beginning of the day for you. Uh, so if that's possible, we can yeah. continue. Okay. 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 Do you, it, anyone wants, yeah. Yeah. Kate, do you want to answer? Well, let Leona La go first okay. and I can go after her. Leonla, will you step yeah. in? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, what I would uh, uh, request her to do is to be, to understand herself. So uh, she has to be more familiar with herself, which means listening to herself first. Uh, she can get in touch with her breath, how, her, how she is breathing and uh, how her body is feeling and different uh, uh, emotions when they emerge, how her body feels and her breath, how it changes. If she starts noticing that, she will gradually, that is the first step, gradually establish a relationship with self. And uh, relationship with self is the basic first step for spirituality. Because that helps you, because if there is no self, you cannot have spirituality. So having self is important first. So establishing that relationship, she can also uh, see if uh, she can uh, have some uh, exercise or even introduction to yoga, if she's already doing, I do not know. Uh, but uh, with that uh, simple uh, practice, she can uh, watch her breath. I think that is the first step, I would say. Thank you. Does anybody want to add to that or? Well, uh, I would also say in terms of bringing out spirituality and um, in the course of our conversation, of starting to use the terms that would bring that out for a person. For example, what is the myth that you're living, looking at your life more as mythic? And also asking a person, where does, uh, where does life stop and where does it begin? That to get to do they believe or have they ever experienced something that feels transpersonal to them, feel, feels spiritual? Because I think people don't talk about it or register it. But you can be out in nature or be by the ocean and you're with the great mother. So to really look at, you know, your life has connection to other aspects of consciousness. And by using that language of opening the door to think about your life beyond just what's happening in the day to day, that everything you do is part of your own story or mythology. And with myths, there's always some kind of alternative that pops up or is developed. So I try to look at it through the arts and symbols as well as the body to bring that aspect of the transpersonal out. Thank you. Thank you. Ratna or Sukhvinder, would you like to add? I would say that uh, the fact that she has asked this question shows that there is a longing. And to me, uh, the, uh, the one of the very powerful doorways and entries into spirituality is what is my longing? What am I longing for? Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it's like it's like the, the, com the compass. Your longing can be is a very safe compass to follow. And most of us don't know what we are longing for. 
you know, when we begin. But yet there is this, there's something knocking inside the heart. And I'm sure that if this question is arisen, it is already knocking. So, um, yeah, I don't have do this, do this, step sure. kind of thing. But I do want to honor your longing behind this question. Mm -hmm. And I hope you will find the direction through that. Yeah. Thank you. I love that because it feels to me like desire, which is my, uh, you know, honor your desire and uh, which I think we all must do. Um, um, Mithu says, Brinda, how do you teach dance therapy during COVID? Um, I just, yeah, how do you do dance therapy through COVID, during times of COVID? I just feel like there's been so much possible over Zoom. Um, and one of the things I find is as I work with clients is getting a sense of when, when we're not physically in the same room that I tune in much more to my body to see what's going on in my body to get a sense of what's happening between us. And, uh, uh, you know, so I, I uh, um, I'd hope that kind of answers your question a little bit. I'm going to just read and all because I feel like I want to kind of give them so Sunanda says, thank you for the wonderful insights and throwing light on the layers that once peeled away allows us to access our inner resources. I'm particularly interested in how your experiences with the online medium has been at a time like this. I ask this especially because the arts connect us kinesthetically to ourselves and to each other. What happens to the sacredness of the physical presence at a time like this? Um, I don't know if maybe... I, I don't know, Kate, if you want to answer this, maybe this uh, about the online medium and then anybody wants. I could just say a few things about using Zoom. Um, it takes a little while to get used to. It's just a different, you're, you become two dimensional instead of three dimensional. But I think someone on the panel said, you know, it's what's happening between the people that is the temenos. Mm -hmm. And that when you change things, you will uh, take a while to get used to it. But the intensity of the relationship will hold you. And so that really creates a, an alternative different type. I mean, there's nothing like body to body being in the same room. However, this is a way of experiencing each other and using your imagination and the, the depth of the relationship. And I feel you could do almost anything on Zoom. Um, and it's so much better than just a phone call or nothing. So hang in there, get familiar with it, and I think it'll start speaking to you, your clients. Thank you. Um, Anisha, when you say as a whole, especially during COVID, there are many individuals who cannot afford therapy want, but want to seek help, what can be done to address this? I just want to say there are a whole uh, lot of helplines that have come up, and we can... Um, I mean, if you write into BIC, I can also send you a list of helplines where people are, even Smart runs a helpline where people are offering their services free and they work with anyone who needs, needs, to, needs help. So, and it's completely free. So if you write to BIC, I will send them the list and maybe you can get a list of helplines that are currently available in the country. Um, um, yeah, I think this, this is kind of an interesting one. Uh, Maria says, I love, I love that you spoke about coming back to one's body as home. For many people, their body is scary and painful place to be and does not feel like home. It would be great to hear of practices, feelings, experiences that the panelists have on enabling their clients to make that transition from the body as painful to the body as pleasurable and a warm home to return to and rest in. Um, well, I, just to say that one of the things that you may look at is what, however a person is holding 
themselves in their body to look for the opposite. That if you bring out the other side of, you know, many people are like this and you say, well, how about if we try something different? Shoulders back and down. I'll take a deep breath. Feel your lungs. Of presenting the alternative, the opposite of what the body can offer. And I think also we have we forget gratitude mm-hmm. about what does work and what you know we focus on what's hurting but there's so many other parts of the body to have gratitude for so to just go from what is to the opposite and what is working in your body and your life thank you Sukhwinder and Leonla, do you have anything to add to that? What a beautiful question. Yeah. Um, coming back into the home, the body is the most denied part, you know, uh, part of us. We just live from the head up. You know, we've been taught to live from the head up. And the rest is all kind of, you know, trudging along. So... Uh, I would say that it's a, it's a slow journey, but returning home to the body is one of the most beautiful uh, ways in which we bring the feminine alive. <clears throat> so, uh, practices of movement are very, very powerful and uh, releasing of traumas because our bodies are frozen. There is so much shame and guilt and fear, which is stuck. You know, it, it's actually, it's taking up spaces inside our body. So we, we, we have gone numb. So the ability to feel back, it's a slow process of healing and releasing traumas and uh, bringing the joy back. So, um, Trauma work is part of it. Shadow work is part of it. Uh, movement, expressive art therapy, all these are part of bringing embodied presence. So then, so the new vibrant leader is going to be the one who is embodying his and her knowledge. Because we've, we've accumulated so much here. But now it has to be integrated as me. I have to digest it And after digesting, that energy has to be distributed in my body and I have to live it. So it's it's not this kind of a process, but this is a good time to begin right away. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. So what I want to say is, uh, when we uh, look at our bodies, what whatever you are saying, that is mind dominating on the body. All these are concepts that shame or pain and uh, body's posture, all uh, body is burdened by, by the mind's concepts. So when we say that we are scared to come to the uh, body, Actually, it is not we are, we are scared to come to the body because of the mind, whatever concepts we have filled in there and created that we have made a statue of our body through our mind. So I think uh, if uh, we are not able to hear, listen to our bodies because of the mind, I think so what we need to do is free the body from the mind because all these are concepts whatever has happened in the body and uh, the judgment about it all are concepts so free yourself and your body from concepts Mm -hmm. and listen to the body so uh, when i'm saying free yourself uh, from the concepts 
understand that thoughts have power and these thoughts have burdened the body and shackled the body so free yourself so sit down give time to yourself listen what all thoughts are coming about your body and one by one understand that when you are scared and uh, i think uh, that way uh, that whatever the mind is burdening the body that burden has to be removed and listen to the body thank you thank you there is one i mean there are a couple of questions but I, i would like to take this question because i think it's important uh it's from milly she says hi brinda i don't want to be a downer but i would like to understand the impact of retrieving retreating or moving inwards when it is forced as is happening on the during the pandemic rather than in merging from one's free uninhibited choice the forced retreat feels like a resignation and that has its own implications uh so what are the different views on this when it's forced upon us um forced to move in what yeah i mean like the pandemic we're kind of forced to sit in sit at home and you know um any uh, would you like to answer did you i'm sorry would you like to answer this me yeah did you say <laughs> yeah i mean um i mean i yeah i I don't, I I think um I think it sometimes I feel like when it, when it is forced uh, or it feels forced um uh, when when, the, when there's no choice you have to move in uh, I, I mean what is the choice right we were and then there's something to discover there and I feel like there's a whole world to discover there and I don't think and I often I mean I I don't know but I do think a lot of times retreating inwards doesn't happen out of free choice at least not the first time you know if if we are so happy in the outside world why would we retreat inside you know it's Absolutely. it's often it's often like retreating in what is is searching for something or longing for something or trying to you know um so I I mean I think even when it's forced um I mean that's my sense I don't know what what you all how you all feel about I agree. in fact yeah. if you go for a vipassana retreat you know you go voluntarily for the retreat but on the first day on the third day they keep the doors locked all the exit doors are locked because mm-hmm. people want to run away it mm-hmm. is so frightening to face yourself on you know the first three days they just want to run so it is even in a voluntary way it is not easy so um i agree with brinda that um, very few people would in this in this world of rushing and accumulation and speed would say i'm ready for a retreat other than me i am always ready for a retreat <laughs> so uh yeah i think this is there is some larger design at work which says everybody pause and retreat and relook at your life and reevaluate your life so um yeah it is forced for everyone it's a, i would i would say make the most of this this opportunity to self reflect okay yeah. right. you want to speak yeah no uh, see one way of looking at it is uh, feel you you feel forced but it also can be an opportunity so uh, it can be seen as both so that depends on the interpretation and uh, when uh, simply forced actually the person is why the person is going in work it is also because the person may feel uh, restless because there is nothing else to do so it can also be opportunity and uh, to Uh, that the universe has provided for so it can be taken in different uh, ways thank you yes to say, well what are the things that i i feel and i've witnessed that comes up when you're told to do something is the rebellious part 
and usually you get angry and you don't want to and we all feel that we go through the flow of you know there's times where if i have to put another mask on my face you know um so to allow that but to, and this relates to another question that was asked about despair mm -hmm. i think that a lot of times the anger is a cover over covering over despair and the beauty of having a relationship with someone where you can open up to how you really feel, how you're experiencing things, and to be witnessed when you're in despair it has a real healing quality. And we ha we're usually told to hide it. So I guess in an overview of combining the two questions of allow the anger it you know anger can open up a lot to creativity but it also can be a cover for a deeper some deep feelings of despair and the beauty of it is that you're with someone you're held with them while you're experiencing some of the deepest most vulnerable feelings and we need to allow all the feelings that are there. Absolutely. Thank you. I think we have to end here. It, um, you know, uh, we have run out of time. Uh, uh, there's a question about how do we train the future generation? I think um, in uh, emotional resilience, I would say constantly accessing self, you know, giving them ways to get, be in touch with, with their inner self. Um, so uh, just a big thank you to all three of you for being here and for really extending your time so generously by even half an hour, you know, and uh, thank you so much. I, uh, I, mean, I think these are important conversations to be had and um, yeah. Thank you for organizing you. it too and for guiding us. I have thank to say, uh, we at BIC are uh, delighted and so glad to partner with uh, the Studio for Movement Art and Therapy, SMART for short, uh, in Bangalore for this very important and such a wonderful session. In a time of such uh, internalized anxiety and uncertainty, I want to thank each of you for your voices and nuances that I can say on a personal level as well has brought some validation and um, at least a mild sense of security and that it's okay. It's all okay. And there's someone to hear us out. Um, thank, thank you, Leonila Ratna, who's uh, uh, just uh, left. Uh, Sukhvinder, and thank you so much, Brinda, for thinking up this session. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. And do let us know your thoughts on either email or any of our and uh, Smart's social media pages. And good night, everyone. Thank you, Lika. Okay, thank you, Brenda. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.